question for you this morning. Have you ever considered what is the most important word in the Bible? Of all the things that you could choose, and there's a lot of them, what is there one that you might consider to be the most important? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was years ago working with kids in, in Sunday school or children's church, um, it seemed like there was just this one little girl who no matter what question you ask, her answer to the question was Jesus. Now actually that was pretty shrewd because you know, he is the answer to most of our, our problems and, and the things that we face in life. But she always gave Jesus as the answer and I'm sure that Somewhere in there is a sermon and an argument could be made that that the word or the name Jesus is the most important word in the Bible. But that's not the one I have in mind. And I'm not sure that there is exactly one, but there are good arguments that could be made for a, a lot of different words. I did a little bit of research trying to figure out um, <clears throat> what other people thought about the question, people a lot smarter than me. And you can make arguments for words like God or resurrection, eternal creation, sin, mercy, maybe even love. And the list could go on and on and on. And honestly, there really is no one right answer, but a number of good ones. In, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, I want to read some verses. It's in the fifth chapter of Luke, first 11 verses, if you have your Bible, follow along. But we'll be uh, checking out different uh, passages over the next few minutes here. Luke, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, 
that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets out for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, your word, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Peter considered himself to be an excellent fisherman, I'm sure, and with good reason. This was his way of making a living. This was his profession. And we don't know a lot about his background, but he had built up a pretty good business with his friends, James and John. And they had been fishing for, well, we don't know how many years. It was most likely a, a family business that had been passed down. And their experience that day was something that they had not encountered before. They were experts, they were authorities on what they were doing, but this was something new. You ever been working on a project and somebody comes along and starts giving you unsolicited advice? Don't you just love it? You know, you're working on a car, or you're working on something at your house, and here comes somebody that uh, just looks over your shoulder and, are you sure this wouldn't be a better way, or how about if you try that? And it kind of can be maybe a little irritating. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> see, Tom, that's kind of the reaction that Peter had. Imagine, here comes a carpenter telling a fisherman how to do his job. And not only had this Jesus commandeered his boat to use as a platform to preach from, now he was telling him how to do his job. Just who was this guy? They had fished all day and they'd come up with nothing. Not a zilch. Now, this guy comes along and tells him he was doing it all wrong. The nerve. Now, Peter didn't really want to throw out his nets again for, for several good reasons. One thing, he had just spent the morning cleaning them and to take it all back out, go out and try to fish some more and have to clean them again wasn't real appealing. And he was a fisherman by trade and he knew the waters. He knew when and where the fish would be. And his own expertise, again, professional here, his own experience and expertise told him there was no real reason to try again. There was nothing there. And he even went to tell the Lord, we've already tried. Simon started to protest and he said, 
Master, we have toiled all night, and we've caught nothing. But there's something here that happened, something in Peter's mind that caused him to pause. You, you can almost sense it in his words as you read them. Read the words. You can almost hear a sigh in Simon's voice when he says, nevertheless. Did you realize one word can change a life? That one word changed Peter's life forever. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. I think a good case could be made for saying nevertheless is the most important word in the Bible. Now you think Peter was acting on faith just then? I, I don't think so. I think he had his doubts. You can tell by his tone and his actions that he didn't think it was going to do any good. But for all the flack we give Peter sometimes, he did it anyway. And his obedience was rewarded. <clears throat> he caught more fish than he knew what to do with. And that's when he left his nets and he followed Jesus. That nevertheless changed him from a fisherman to a fisher of men. Amen. This is one time when I, I think obedience was more important than faith. Has God ever asked you to do something and you didn't want to? But maybe because of lack of faith or doubt, but you did it anyway. Nevertheless, when you think about it, it's a powerful little word. Peter obeyed. And isn't that what God asks of any of us? Jesus never asked his followers to do anything that he would not do himself. <clears throat> that one word can change a negative into a positive. Max Lucado talks about his neighbor who was trying to teach his six-year-old son how to shoot a basketball. <clears throat> and they were out there in the backyard and the dribble in the basketball and the, the father sank a couple of baskets there and tried to show his son, this, this is how you do it, real easy. And the little boy tried hard, but he could not get that ball 10 feet in the air, no matter what. And the guy got more and more frustrated. The little boy tried again and again, and the more he tried, the more frustrated he got. And finally, after hearing his father talk about how easy it was for the tenth time, the boy said, it's easy for you up there. You don't know how hard it is from down here. You and I can never say that about God. When Jesus became man and lived among us, he walked where we walk. He suffered what we suffer. He was tempted as we are tempted. He was Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. Let's look at another passage in the Gospel of Mark 14, verse 32. <clears throat> then they came to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me, 
Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping, said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away and prayed and spoke the same words. And when he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. Then he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It is enough. The hour has come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. There it is again. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The human side of Jesus desperately wanted to avoid the cross. He prayed fervently that he would not have to go down that path as any of us would have prayed. Crucifixion was the cruelest form of execution that's ever been devised by men. But he said, nevertheless, I will do what the Father says. I think sometimes we don't stress how important obedience is. Our faith may be weak, but God doesn't always ask us to have strong faith. You remember what scripture says about faith as a grain mustard seed. Mm -hmm. Our faith may be weak, but God doesn't ask us to always have strong faith. Remember the man that came to Jesus asking him to heal his daughter? He said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Yes, faith is important, but sometimes it is enough to simply obey. There's a best-selling book called No Bad Dogs, written by a lady named Barbara Woodhouse, and she writes, Thousands of dogs appear to love their owners. They welcome them home with an enthusiastic wagging of the tail and jumping up they follow them about the house and happily and to the normal person seeing the dog, their affection is true and is deep. But to the experienced dog trainer, this outward show is not enough. The true test of love takes place when the dog has the opportunity to go out on his own as soon as the door is left open by mistake. And it goes off and sometimes doesn't return for hours. True love in dogs is apparent when a door is left open and the dog still stays happily within earshot of its owner. For the owner must be the be-all and end-all of a dog's life. <clears throat> David Jeremiah says that the real test of our Christianity isn't seen in our work or our words. It is found in this. When we have an opportunity to wander away, to disobey, to leave his presence, do we choose instead to stay close to him, to abide in Christ and to obey? Is your love for Christ seen in your obedience and utter loyalty to Him and to Him alone? <clears throat> my dad, and I've talked about my family a few times, but my dad grew up in a family of 11 kids. And he used to tell me stories of what it was like, and he, he would tell me some things about my grandfather, who I, I never knew. He died when uh, the day after my second birthday, so I, I have no memory of him. But from the stories that my dad told, <clears throat> he was pretty strict with his kids, uh, especially the boys. 
growing up during the Great Depression was tough. They were poor and it, it was hard to keep food on the table sometimes. But they always had a big garden and everybody was expected to pitch in and take care of the garden. They would hoe, they would help plant, they would help harvest. Everybody had to help. Well, <clears throat> my dad told me about one time when they were given instructions to hoe the corn in the garden, but, you know, as boys are prone to do, uh, they found a lot of other things that were more entertaining than hoeing corn. <clears throat> But when my grandfather got home and found out that they hadn't done what he had told them to do, well, let's, let's just say he was less than happy. Um, my dad said that they spent that night hoeing the garden by the light of the moon. I don't imagine they disregarded the instructions too much after that. My grandfather had asked for obedience, not excuses. And sometimes that's what God asked of us. In John 15, 10, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And what about partial obedience? Have you ever told your kids, well, if a job is worth doing, it's doing right? I heard that one a few times. Mm -hmm. To do anything else is only partial obedience. If the Lord gives instructions, He expects us to do exactly what He has said. If we're allowing things in our lives that don't fit our life in Christ, that we are only partially obeying Him. God has expected obedience from the beginning. The Garden of Eden was God's first classroom to teach obedience, and they failed. The importance of doing what the Lord says is shown in this story of Adam and Eve. God didn't talk to them about faith or humility. He only talked to them about obedience. To not partake of these two trees. Mm -hmm. And here we are, all of these centuries later, we're still struggling to get it right. What about the doubters that are on the outside? There's plenty that would tell us that we can never do something. That we will fail. But the Word has something to say to them, too. Reading some words out of 2 Samuel, now chapter 5. Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and spoke, saying, Indeed, we are your bone and your flesh. Also in time past, when Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my people Israel and be ruler over Israel. Therefore all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron <clears throat> before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months. And in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all Israel and Judah. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Doubters can weigh us down spiritually. Amen. They want to drag us down to their level. 
David's enemies had told him, you can't take this city. You can't conquer us. Why, even blind and crippled people could beat you. And then comes that word again. Nevertheless, he did defeat them. <clears throat> During World War II, an Air Force colonel was piloting a B-29 bomber. And during an attack on Tokyo, his plane lost two <clears throat> engines. Home base was over a thousand miles away. The colonel said to his crew, he says, I have never believed in ditching a plane as long as it's flying. Let's try to make it home. So they threw out everything they could, everything that wasn't just absolutely essential including ammunition and armor. And the colonel landed that plane on the sands of Saipan and was decorated as a hero. I wonder how many of his crew thought, well, this is the end, we are finished. If they all thought that, they might not have made it. If we're going to make it safely home, if we're going to get to heaven, there may be some things in our lives that we need to throw overboard. Right. We need to get rid of the doubters in our lives. Maybe it's an unhealthy or destructive habit. How about an unhealthy relationship? Amen. It could be an obsession like greed or, or racism. Um, it pays to travel light. We can get lots farther without bulky baggage. But let's not forget that that word nevertheless can turn a positive into a negative as well. In Numbers chapter 13, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel, in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They told them, we went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. In this story, there's that word nevertheless again, but it took a positive attitude and turned it into a negative. You remember the story of the 12 spies that Moses sent into the promised land. They were scouting it out to see if they could take the land of the 12 spies only two, Joshua and Caleb, came back with a positive report. Amen. The other ten says, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a great land. It's beautiful. It's fruitful. But they are so strong, we cannot take them. All twelve of those men saw the same thing. They experienced all the beauty and the wonder of Canaan. But there were ten of them that saw no way that they could take that land. It wasn't just Joshua and Caleb that saw the good fruit of the land, that they saw how fertile it was. It wasn't just Joshua and Caleb that ate of the plenty of the land and brought some back to show to Moses. However, in ten of the spies, there were ten there were ten that changed the entire picture when they said, nevertheless. They witnessed God's promises, but they did not trust His protection. God did not heal them and lead them to this point just to leave them wishing, if only. But 85% of the spies use the power of nevertheless to change a positive we can 
into a negative, we can't. Their attitude was, yeah, there, there's plenty of promise in the land that we spied out. But in spite of all of that, we don't think we can do it. It was the nevertheless that brought the nation of Israel to a crisis. Because it put a damper on what God wanted to do for his people Israel. Nevertheless is a powerful little word. It can be a positive or a negative. It's up to us and how we use it. It is a word that can drive us forward or drag us back. You might remember, well, or not, maybe you've heard stories of it. You ever, you ever had a Chevy Nova, a car, a Chevy Nova? You remember them? Yeah. Well, they were really successful marketing this car in the United States. And it dominated the markets for many years. And they got so encouraged by the sales in America that they decided to sell it throughout the world. Well, unfortunately, the Nova did not sell well in Mexico and other Latin American countries. More ads were ordered, marketing campaigns were stepped up, but the sales still remained stagnant. So, the sales directors, the marketing people, were baffled. Why had this car sold so well in America and not in Mexico or Latin America? Why wasn't it selling there? And when they discovered the answer, it was kind of embarrassing, I'm sure, because in Spanish, the word Nova, or split into two words, Nova, means no go. It was already in the name of the car. Won't run, you know. <laughs> Nevertheless, gives us the power and ability to go forward, to do those things that God asks us to do. We don't need a marketing campaign. We just need to act on God's Word. Amen. I'm sure the lakes of Galilee held plenty of fish. But until Peter was willing to make that extra step and cast out the nets again against everything he believed and thought possible, he would not know. And so Peter obeyed. The word nevertheless can be a positive force or it can be a negative force. It's up to us. When God speaks to us, when he calls us to do something, no matter how we might feel on the inside about our possibilities and what our capabilities, remember that Nevertheless, if we obey Him, great things can happen. Nevertheless, a powerful little word that we shouldn't just read over in passing. It's important. Nevertheless, if we do what God wants us to do, then we can change a world. Let, let's stand and we'll have a word of prayer here in closing. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. May we never underestimate your power and your ability to work wonders in this world. Lord, help us to obey. Even when it goes against all reason and all common sense, May we be able to say to you, nevertheless, Lord, not my will, but thine. And help us to learn to act on those words. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here safely. We thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit that we have felt here.
Walk with us, Lord, and give us strength for the journey ahead. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.